Beautiful. Eternity. For Bible believers everywhere, the subject of eternity generates many questions, including questions about the end, the end of time, the day when Jesus will come back and everything on this earth as we know it will be over. And the questions only begin to multiply. Things like, when is that going to be? What's going to happen? Uh, What will become of the earth? Will it be just different or will it be destroyed? What will happen to our bodies? And the questions go on and on. This Sunday morning Sunday school series in the summertime, we will be focusing on a lot of these things. Even though the lesson today is self-contained, we have a whole series on this this, uh, subject coming up. And these questions can easily be spurred by volatile world events. When you talk about national unrest or big change or talk of war, questions like these are spurned into the minds of even people who are in the secular world. They will ask these profound and interestingly often profitable questions. But the question today, it's a given, when? The first question is when? Is it going to be today? Is it going to be tomorrow? Is it going to be a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now? Does the Bible give us any clues or does it tell us? When is Jesus coming back to end time as we know it? Well, if you go apart from Scripture, the theories are a legion. Historically, you can travel back and find many vain attempts to predict the end of time. William Miller, for example. If you travel back to that figure associated with the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist, you can see that he predicted that the return would be within a year's time of March 21st, 18. 43 and March 21st of 1844. He built the anticipation of everyone in his camps for this day. And of course, as you know, that date came and went. And he just professed that he assumed he miscalculated. So he did some refiguring and he said it would be in five months from that point, October 22nd, 1844. And well, we both know how that turned out. That date came and that date went. Also, associating with an effort that he wanted to advance, Charles Russell. Charles Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witness, advanced the idea that Jesus was going to return in 1874. And that wait, again, proved to be in vain. And even in the past few decades, have you lost track of the times that several authors have made quite profitable ventures, potentially projecting and predicting the return of, or the event in this case, of what they call the rapture. And we'll talk about that in a minute and more later on in the summer. But one of those, uh, well, those once future dates are all now history. So what's going on with even these attempts to date this return? I need to say something up front. All such predictions stem from just a few, or I should say the mishandling of just a few verses, some of them from the first half of Matthew chapter 24, which incidentally was not spoken by Jesus about the end of time at all, but about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's both textual and historical, but many people prefer to ignore or argue that fact away. And some of these verses they use come from Jewish apocalyptic literature, literature like the Revelation, which we will be focusing on in Ron's classes in the fall quarter. The Revelation and other apocalyptic literature meant to be interpreted symbolically, not literally. And yet, they are happy to do so when it accommodates their preferences and beliefs. They not only then ignore plainly taught scripture and clearly stated prose in the epistles, but they also are pulling verses out of context, which are not meant to apply to the end of time at all. Anyone choosing to go to a study of Scripture and give it any degree of academic honesty and scrutiny will realize that any such prediction is folly. Because we have passages like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, printed and provided for you in today's handout. Speaking of this very thing, he says, The day of the Lord, that day, will come like a thief in the night. It's unexpected. You won't suspect it. Listen to the words of Jesus himself, God in flesh, answering now his second question. Uh, The disciples thought that they were asking one, but no, they were asking two. And Jesus, after he deals with their first one, is now answering their second question. 
And he does talk about the end of time. Notice verse 36. Matthew 24, 36. No one knows about that day and hour, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. I suppose that to feel uniquely special and privileged with divine insight, they would want to convince themselves that they are the exception of the phrase, no one knows. But the point is, anytime someone claims to have some discovery, to profess knowledge of the Lord's return, they have just revealed themselves as false teachers. Because we know what the Bible just clearly stated. No one will have accurately predicted that day. The day that will come unexpectedly. And that's just it. We don't know when. That's the assumed question from the start. But we don't know the answer to it. And the answer is we don't. Frankly, that's a good thing. This knowledge kept from us, this ignorance that we live in in anticipation, frankly, facilitates genuine faith. It motivates our sincere desire to live for Him and evangelize the world until He comes. We just simply must stay ready and encourage people to get ready, letting their life glorify God, which is the purpose of humanity. We don't know when. We don't need to. But there's another question people ask, and that's the basis for our lesson in the majority of our time is what? What is going to happen on that great day? Oh, there have been such a proliferation of propaganda surrounding the Lord's return that I'm just wanting to let today, our brief time, let the Bible speak and refute these more prominent theories. From the Bible, here are some things that will not happen. We're going to have to address some things that will not happen first. When Christ comes, this is a big one, he will not set up a kingdom. Say what? He will not set up a kingdom. One of the more popular ideas about the last days is that Jesus will come and establish some type of utopic reign for a thousand years, during which there will be peace and prosperity all across the earth. And this is a type of the millennial theory where the temple as you study in the Old Testament, will be restored, rebuilt. Temple worship will be restored. But Jesus will be sitting on David's throne and ruling to uh, evangelize the world for a thousand years. The roots of this false doctrine go back to a man named C.I. Schofield and a few others. He made a chain reference Bible and, and made a few veiled comments and commentary notes that that some people took and went a great distance with. It's incredible, and he made so recently in time. And yet it's been so widely believed and proliferated. And I'll have to say that, yes, as we've studied the past six months in the Old Testament, there are prophecies about the Messiah coming to set up a kingdom. There are prophecies about the Messiah sitting on David's throne. And yet... The Old Testament, pointing to the new, the new covenant in Christ, which he came to fulfill, teaches that those prophecies have been fulfilled, specifically that the Messiah has come, that he has already established his kingdom in the form of reborn citizens, the members of his church, over which he rules now. So let's hear some of those inspired interpretations of those very prophecies going right to the beginning of this new Christian era in Acts chapter 2. You remember after the ascension and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter with the keys of the kingdom being professed to the people in languages they understood so that all could understand. Acts chapter 2, he was speaking about the resurrection of Christ in verse 29. Let's notice verse 29. Peter said, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. And you can go to his tomb to his, this day. We have his tomb to this day. But he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him an oath. That he would place one of his descendants on his throne. All right, he's about to explain this. He says a lot in such a short time. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he, Christ, was not abandoned to the grave or left there, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God. 
He has, notice the tense, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Peter says a whole lot in such a few words. Peter is showing us, for application of our intent today, he is showing us that all that Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled, how? In the coronation of Jesus, which occurred at his resurrection. Peter says this is how, oh, this is important, this is how Jesus is presently setting on David's throne and ruling over his kingdom. So, all the prophecies about this kingdom rule from the Old Testament are fulfilled in the resurrection, the ascension and coronation of Jesus the Christ, our Savior, risen and exalted. Just imagine, just imagine the worldwide impact for generations to come if everyone across the religious community and for that matter the world were to heed and believe the truthful implications of that passage. Wow. We could also look at Colossians 1.13. It says it pretty clearly there. 1 Corinthians 15.20-26. 20 it says it there. And we will look at those verses and many more in this summertime. But they all say the same thing. Jesus is reigning over his kingdom now. And some can then ask, well, if that's the case, and if it's so plainly taught in Scripture, then where and how do they get all these other ideas? Good question. Now, my mind theologically jumps to what we learn in John 8, 44, how that the devil is the father of lies and confusion. That's where it jumps too quickly. But academically, I would simply say, they use a different hermeneutic standard. They use, because of some biased uh, insight or biased uh, slants, they use a different method of interpreting passages like those few handful of verses I referenced earlier, Matthew 24 and Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 20, the millennial theory depends on a literal interpretation of the thousand years mentioned there. It depends on it. And frankly, if we begin to take literally every image, every symbol, every number, literally in that apocalyptic book of imagery and symbolism, we would be some of the most confused people on the face of the planet but we know, written apocalyptically, and Ron will be dealing with this in his fall quarter series, focusing on this book entirely. Written apocalyptically, and from other Jewish writings that are of the same to encourage the people of their time, usually during intense persecution, we know what the number 10 signifies. And that the number 1,000 is a multiple of that, so it represents completeness, cubed to perfection, the completeness of an era. And therefore, if we interpret that symbolically... The thousand-year reign represents the entire Christian era in which we are living now, over which Christ reigns now. That is consistent with Scripture. And Christ then is not coming to set up a kingdom. The kingdom is already here. So isn't that interesting? And we're just beginning. Here's a second thing that will not happen, and it's a spinoff, so it's worthy mentioning of this. It's a spinoff of the millennial theory that when Jesus returns, there will not be special favors given to the Jews. This is very interesting because we're in the realm of salvation issue if you have a misconception of the purpose of the church and its saving nature of being grafted within it. What did Jesus come for? God doesn't fail, right? He did exactly what he has came to do. During which this idea... That Jesus will return just before, now I'm saying that their idea is just before he reigns, that he will return for a short time. Jews will travel to their home of Palestine and restore, well, receive special honors and favors and be commissioned to evangelize the world during that time. That idea holds less weight than really the first because the New Testament itself clearly and boldly declares that if it's accepted and believed as the completion of all inspired text, that the time of any one nation or race of people to receive any special favors have long since passed and will not be revived. What was his plan all along? Let's go now to Acts chapter 10. Do you remember, well, back in Acts chapter 10, when Peter had to be coaxed by God a couple times to say, hey, you do what I'm about to tell you. What was the mission for God saying you, or the purpose, you go and make sure that you see the 
Gentiles have the gospel open to them. It's been in his mind all along. And Peter did, after some coaxing, exactly what God said. And for their benefit and ours, let's listen to what Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Then Peter spoke and said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every generation who fear him and do what is right. If only the Israelites of days past and the Jews during their time of covenant promise via circumcision would have seen that role and evangelize the world then so that people would all around anticipate the coming of the Messiah and be those God-fearers that the New Testament often highly esteems and the Old Testament as well. If only, if there's any remaining doubt about God coming to bestow special favoritism on, on anyone except the reborn saints, listen to Paul's summary of the matter in Galatians chapter 3. I love this chapter. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 28 and following. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, no distinctions, no, no hierarchy of importance. No, no, no. You are all one. In Christ Jesus. That is so beautiful. The people mindset of the world don't want that. They don't want to be equal to anyone. They want to be ahead of everybody else. But in God's standard, this is an elevated status where you're equal. You're a saint with your fellow siblings. And take note of this, verse 29. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according, heirs according to the promise. He just changed the world with that paradigm shift of understanding. But that's how it's been all along. Christians are children of Abraham by faith? Yes. Reborn disciples are spiritual Israel? Yes. Citizens of his kingdom now. Well, that's the other thing that won't happen. What about the next point three? When Jesus comes back again, there will not be a so-called rapture. And I hate to say, but we'll have to spend a whole class on this sometime. I, I just don't like to focus on false doctrine at all. Just equip your mind with truth and you can see the difference. But sometimes it's good to state this. There won't be a rapture, people. I suppose that everyone knows this idea, though, even people who don't know much about Christianity or even believe in it by any means, but they see it. It's proliferated on every screen and, and it's very profitable. It makes for a good story sometimes. But it's the idea that there's going to be one day a uh, evacuation, an evacuation, or more like a vaporization of, of the saints, of all believers. And after God uh, teleports people off of this earth, those remaining will have seven years of tribulation, and then we'll see the thousand-year reign, and then, well, some or all of everything else we've talked about. It gets confusing and complicated when you let mankind get involved instead of just going from what the Scripture says. But this whole concept that I've just described goes back to a man named James Brooks. Uh, he's a big part of this. In the latter part of just the 19th century, just that recent ago in human history. And it does not come from an honest exegesis of any passage, but from an eisegesis of it. What's that mean? Uh, uh, exegesis, you get it from it. Eisegesis means you have an idea and you're trying to fit it into it. You cannot read the scripture and walk away with the ideas that I just described. False doctrine kind of builds over time. And uh, one wrong idea goes to the next wrong idea. But the scriptures they use, and we will deal with this more in detail in our classes, but 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, uh, and I've supplied those for you. I will later go into detail about how they want to attach a definition to a word that is used in the Greek, but doesn't have the intent they wish it did. But they have to later admit it's not there. But you could use it, they say. That allows them to believe what they want instead of what the Scripture says. But in both of those passages, Paul speaks about the dead being raised and then the living being caught up in the air. And given, at that time, a new incorruptible body to live with for eternity. So even if you just read those two passages, in the straightforward prose of the epistle, 
there is no indication that life will continue afterward on this planet. To the contrary, we have other plainly taught passages, stated passages like Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Every knee will then bow. Every tongue is going to confess on that day of his return. Matthew 25, verses 34 through 46 tells us that immediately upon Jesus' appearing, there will then be that great judgment scene where all will be there. Not some rapturous disappearance of the saints and then all the other events I mentioned, but a scene of holy judgment for all. That scene will represent where his kingdom citizens will share in his glory and those who have chosen to deny God will have their preference uh, eternally professed. After talking of all of these things that won't happen, I'm now more than eager and happy to share with you what will happen on that great day. What will happen? I want to know what the Bible tells me and what to anticipate with great eagerness. The event will be spectacular. Talk about an understatement, but is there any word? I looked at a thesaurus to find any word that gives justice to that event. There is none. It will be spectacular. 1 Thessalonians 4, let's go to that passage, verse 16. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. I am looking forward to that great event where righteousness is on display and sin and death and all that is unrighteous will be visibly conquered. It's evident. Everyone will hear that sound and our attention will be captured in an instant. What else will happen? The dead will be raised. 1 Thessalonians, continuing in verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first, of course. Confirmed also in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, uh, the dead will be raised imperishable. Imperishable. You know, when you're young and healthy in this physical existence, which we've only known, you feel impervious to all the things of this world, But you find out you're not. We will have a spiritual imperishable body. At that moment, everyone you've ever known, everyone throughout all of history, all of humanity, each one's graves will be emptied. And their souls reunited with their body, that spiritually regenerated body that will be specially designed for eternity. What a day to anticipate. There's no stopping it. It's coming we're all going to experience that day one way or another. Okay, so what about those then that are living when Jesus returns? You know, I think that Bible believers everywhere in every generation always hopes that it's their generation that the Lord returns because that is natural. They wouldn't have to physically die. But, but we always hope that that would be the case. But if it's not, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we die first or the Lord returns. Here's what's interesting about those still living at that moment. The Bible says those still living will also be instantly changed. And there's a reason or two why. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, in this case, the word mystery in context means you wouldn't have known it if we hadn't have told it by inspiration, nor can we all ever understand it until we experience it. So there, there's mystery involved even in, with this divine revealing. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Uh, these events, you see, will happen practically simultaneous. The trumpet will sound, the voice of the archangel, the dead will come out of their graves, and the living will be changed, risen. Also that as the Lord returns, the resurrected souls of all humanity throughout time and the transfigured bodies will be able to... To see his glory in that instant. That will be spectacular. There will then be a great separation. We will focus on this in a couple classes coming up. But Matthew 25 verses 31 through 33. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. And all the holy angels with him. He will be on that throne of glory. We will see him there. He's already ruling over his kingdom now. We will see him in his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. That means everyone. 
And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Uh, it kind of goes without saying with many things left a un, un, uh, little unclear. But it's likely that at that moment in the presence of his glory, each one will already know their eternal distinction. But God is an orderly God. And he will get his honor. So after that separation, the fifth event will occur. This is the setting for all to experience that ultimate day of the Lord, that ultimate and final judgment, where God's glorious proclamation will honor the choice of each soul that they made in this life pertaining to Christ. Notice how I worded that. The choice that they've made in this life. How important is it? Of how we deal with Christ, Matthew 25, verse 34, and then skip to verse 41 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father. And imagine the whole of humanity hearing this. Come, you, the sheep on my right hand, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepare for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. You never chose me. Or you left me. Life's primary question is whether we will fulfill its purpose by honoring God through his son. It's that important. And in Jesus' revelation to John, notice again... Chapter 20, let's draw attention to verse 12. This is written in, a, like I said earlier, symbolic. So notice the imagery here and the implications. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. All knowledge is, is exposed. And another book was open, which is the book of life, the word of truth. We can deal with the details of the books later. But, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. At this moment, it only needs to be stated simply that the book of our life will be judged in relation to the book of life. Whether it be an award or a sentence, it will be just and righteous in proportion to the significance of how each one responded in this life to his son's glorious gospel. And I want to remind you that that glorious gospel was graciously given. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Romans six twenty three. For those who chose to live for God, they will forever live with the Father and God, the Son. Christ is our brother, the Holy Spirit. And for those who chose to live only for the things of this world, there is another key scene where at some point, visibly, this will be more than a, meta, a metaphorical uh, demonstration uh, of their ruin. I have to mention it. About that earth, it's going to be destroyed. The destruction of the earth. 2 Peter 3.10 again, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I'll spare some details of our word study for one of our classes, but early translations say laid bare. Even the Latin would understand from the word annihilo to annihilate, same concept. Even without a word study, you can read from Scripture and get the idea that, you know, the earth will not continue for a thousand years after the Lord returns. He isn't coming back to set up a kingdom, but after the judgment, he will deliver to the Father the kingdom which is already here and his. From that point on, all of the safe and all of the saved of that kingdom will forever live with God. And this is why Christians don't fear that day. They don't dread or, or, or have any trepidation or fear of that day because no anxiety whatsoever. 
because of the fact that with every passing day, we are getting close to what we're living for. With great eagerness, we're increasingly expecting it, like the Revelation concludes with, Lord, come quickly, and when He comes, it will be fast. I think about the Spirit in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. From which we also eagerly wait for the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the spirit that Paul had in his first letter to the brethren in Thessalonica, uh, chapter 4, verse 18. And notice this conclusion for us. Encourage one another with these words. I honestly don't know how the lesson has influenced you today. But I would imagine in an assembly like this, the majority of us would be encouraged And we should be. All this talk about the end of time scares some people, but it's not meant to unless you're not right with the Lord. If you're in Christ, then that is a day you anticipate so much. The archangel's voice and the trumpet command of God will be the greatest welcome call home. And the incorruptible body will be marvelous. And then being able to see Jesus as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, In all of His glory, your newfound sight and ability to hear all of these things through your senses will more than repay the toils of this life. For those in Christ, it will be a magnificent day. To those who have not yet accepted and honored Jesus as the Lord He is, and is to be in their life. I reference Ron's comments at communion. We do have idols today. And for a lot of people, it's just themselves. But Christ is Lord. And He will get His honor. But when we learn to love Him for what He's done, in the sight of a holy God, sin is that serious. But He's so loving, He sent His Son to die for us. That when we respond... And he's been patient to give us this opportunity to do so. When we respond to the Lord, we have the opportunity in faith to let him then do what only his power can. With God, all things are possible. And in the context, he's talking about the forgiveness of sin being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And only God can do that. So when we respond in faith, we say, I want the free gift of grace. When we have heard the gospel, I hope we believe it. I hope you believe it today. I hope that you repent of any wrong in your life. And for some people, that means to turn to Christ and live for Him fully. For some people, it means you've made some wrong turns, things not quite right, and you want the prayers of the brethren to help you stay walking that path, as was mentioned by one uh, by Doug's prayer, the sinless life, uh, the idea there of, um, of we can be continually forgiven as we continually walk in the light of Christ. But we need His blood continually cleansing us. We can contact that blood in baptism. And this is what I hope that you respond to if need be as we stand and as we sing.